nuclear fission and fusion. Describe the role of neutrons in causing and sustaining nuclear fission. Describe the conditions necessary to sustain a chain reaction. Explain how nuclear fission can be controlled in a reactor. Describe the radioactivity of plutonium. Distinguish between a uranium-based fission reactor and a breeder reactor. Describe the equivalence of mass and energy. Compare the total mass of the products of fusion to the mass of the nuclei that fused. Explain why thermonuclear fusion reactions are so difficult to carry out. The big idea. A magnetic field surrounds a moving electric charge. In 1939, just at the beginning of World War II, a nuclear reaction was discovered that released much more energy per atom than previously known reactions and had the potential to be used for both explosions and power production. This was the splitting of the atom or nuclear fission. A very different nuclear reaction, nuclear fusion, involves joining two small nuclei together to produce a larger nucleus and can also release huge amounts of energy. Both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion produce vastly more energy per kilogram of matter than any chemical reaction and even more than most other nuclear reactions. The awesome release of this energy in atomic and hydrogen bombs ushered in the present nuclear age. Out of the ashes of despair brought about by these bombs, hope grew that atoms could be used for peaceful purposes, that the energy of nuclear reactions could be used for domestic power instead of arsenals of war. How can you model nuclear reactions? Dip one of the two circular frames provided in a bubble solution and blow a bubble. Catch the bubble between two circular frames. Slowly move the frame apart until the single bubble separates into two bubbles. After producing bubbles in both frames, slowly bring the frames together until the bubbles merge into a single bubble. Observing. Provide a thorough description of the bubble you produced in steps three and four. Predicting. What do you think would happen if you were to carry out steps three and four more rapidly, making generalizations? How do you think the actions of the bubbles in this activity might be used to explain the processes of nuclear fission and fusion? 40.1 Nuclear Fission Biology students know that living tissue grows by the division of cells. The splitting in half of living cells is called fission. In a similar way, the splitting of an atomic nuclei is called nuclear fission. Nuclear fission involves the delicate balance between the attraction of nuclear strong forces and the repulsion of electrical forces within the nucleus. In all known nuclei, the nuclear strong force forces dominate. In uranium, however, the domination is tenuous. If the uranium nucleus is stretched into an elongated shape, as shown in figure 40.1, the electrical forces may push it into an even more elongated shape. Figure 40.1, nuclear deformation leads to fission when repelling electrical forces dominate over attracting nuclear forces. Nuclear fission occurs when the repelling electrical forces within a nucleus overpower the attracting nuclear strong forces. The absorption of a neutron by a uranium nucleus supplies enough energy to cause such an elongation. The resulting fission process may produce many different combinations of smaller nuclei. A typical example is shown in figure 40.2. The energy that is released by the fission of one U-235 atom is enormous, about 7 million times the energy released by the explosion of one TNT molecule.
this energy is mainly in the form of kinetic energy of the fission fragments with some energy given to ejected neutrons and the rest to gamma radiation. Figure 40.2, in a typical example of nuclear fission, one neutron starts the fission of the uranium atom and three more neutrons are produced when the uranium fissions. Five kilograms of U-235 broken up into small separated chunks is subcritical, but if the chunks are put together in a ball shape, it is supercritical. Why? Five kilograms of U-235 in small chunks will not support a sustained reaction because the path for a neutron in each chunk is so short that the neutron is likely to escape through the surface without causing fission. But when the chunks are brought together, there is sufficient material that the neutron is likely to hit a nucleus and to cause fission rather than escape. Chain reaction. Note that one neutron starts the fission of the uranium atom and in the example shown in figure 40.2, three more neutrons are produced when the uranium fissions. Between two and three neutrons are produced in most nuclear fission reactions. These new neutrons can in turn cause the fissioning of two or three other nuclei, releasing from four to nine more neutrons. If each of these succeeds in splitting just one atom, the next step in the reaction will produce between eight and 27 neutrons and so on. This makes a chain reaction. A chain reaction is a self-sustaining reaction in which one reaction event stimulates one or more additional reaction events to keep the process going. Why do chain reactions not occur in naturally occurring uranium ore deposits? They would if all uranium atoms fissioned so easily. Fission occurs mainly for the rare isotope uranium-235. As figure 40.3 shows, only 0.7% or one part in 140 of the uranium in pure uranium metal is uranium-235. When the prevalent isotope U-238 absorbs neutrons from fission, it does not undergo fission. So a chain reaction can be snuffed out by the neutron absorbing U-238. It is rare for uranium deposits in nature to spontaneously undergo a chain reaction. A model of a chain reaction is shown in figure 40.4. If a chain reaction occurred in a chunk of pure uranium-235 the size of a baseball, an enormous explosion would likely result. Figure 40.3, only one part in 140 of naturally occurring uranium is uranium-235. Figure 40.4, in this chain reaction, only two emitted neutrons per reaction are shown. If the chain reaction were started in a smaller chunk of uranium-235, however, no explosion would occur. Why? Because a neutron ejected by a fission event travels a certain average distance through the material before it encounters another uranium nucleus and triggers another fission event. If the piece of uranium is too small, as in figure 40.5a, a neutron is likely to escape through the surface before it finds another nucleus. On the average, fewer than one neutron per fission will be available to trigger more fission, and the chain reaction will die out. As figure 40.5b shows, in a bigger piece, a neutron can move farther through the material before reaching a surface. Figure 40.5, an exaggerated view of a chain reaction is shown here. A, in a small piece of pure uranium-235, the chain reaction dies out. B, in a larger piece, a chain reaction builds up. Then, more than one neutron from each fission event on the average will be available to trigger more fission. The chain reaction will build up to enormous energy. Critical mass. The critical mass is the amount of mass for which each 
fission event produces, on the average, one additional fission event. It is just enough to hold even. A subcritical mass is one in which the chain reaction dies out. A supercritical mass is one in which the chain reaction builds up explosively. In figure 40.6, there are two pieces of pure uranium-235, each of them subcritical. Neutrons readily reach a surface and escape before a sizable chain reaction builds up. But if the pieces are joined together, there will be more distance available for neutrons to travel and greater likelihood for their triggering fission before escaping through the surface. If the combined mass is supercritical, we have a nuclear fission bomb. A simplified diagram of an idealized uranium fission bomb is shown in figure 40.7. The construction of a uranium fission bomb is not a formidable task. The difficulty is separating enough uranium-235 from the more abundant uranium-238. Figure 40.7 a simplified diagram of a uranium fission bomb is shown here. In an actual gun-type weapon, only one of the two pieces of uranium is fired towards the other one, which is the target. It took Manhattan Project scientists and engineers more than two years to extract enough uranium-235 from uranium ore to make the bomb that was detonated over Hiroshima in 1945. Uranium isotope separation is still a difficult, expensive process today. Concept check. What causes nuclear fission? 40.2 Uranium enrichment. Uranium-235 undergoes fission when it absorbs a neutron, but uranium-238 normally doesn't. In order to sustain a chain reaction in uranium, the sample used must contain a higher percentage of U-235 than occurs naturally. Since atoms U-235 and U-238 are virtually identical chemically, they cannot be separated by chemical reaction. They must be separated by physical means. Gaseous diffusion offers a way. Industrial-scale separation of the two isotopes takes advantage of the difference in their masses. For a given temperature, heavier molecules move more slowly on the average than lighter ones. Gaseous diffusion uses uranium hexafluoride gas. Molecules of the gas with U-235 move faster than molecules with U-238. The gas initially entering the chamber is 0.7% uranium-235. These lighter molecules hit the diffusion membrane on average 0.4% more often than any given molecule with uranium-238. So the gas leaving the chamber is ever so slightly enriched in uranium-235 isotope. It requires passing the gas through thousands of interconnecting stages to end up with uranium sufficiently enriched in uranium-235 isotopes for it to be used in a power reactor, which is 3% uranium-235, or a bomb, uranium-235 is greater than 90%. Notes. Heavier molecules in a gas move more slowly on average than lighter ones of at the same temperature because they have the same average kinetic energy. One half capital M V squared equals one half small m velocity squared. A newer method of isotope separation involves gas centrifuges. The uranium hexafluoride gas is spun at high speed. The lighter molecules with uranium-235 tend towards the center of the centrifuge. The slightly enriched gas at the center are collected and sent forward to another centrifuge. It may require thousands of stages before the uranium is sufficiently enriched to be used as fuel. Concept check. What is necessary to sustain a chain reaction? 
40.3, the nuclear fission reactor. A liter of gasoline can be used to make a violent explosion, or it can be burned slowly to power an automobile. Similarly, uranium can be used for bombs or in the controlled environment of a power reactor. Figure 40.8 shows a diagram of a nuclear fission power plant. About 19% of the electrical energy in the United States is generated by nuclear fission reactors. A nuclear fission reactor generates energy through a controlled nuclear fission reaction. These reactors are simply nuclear furnaces, which, like fossil fuel furnaces, do nothing more elegant than boil water to produce steam for a turbine. Figure 40.8, a nuclear fission power plant converts nuclear energy to electrical energy. The greatest practical difference in the amount of fuel involved, one kilogram of uranium fuel less than the size of a baseball yields more energy than 30 freight car loads of coal, component of a fission reactor. A reactor contains three main components, the nuclear fuel combined with a moderator, the control rods, and water. The nuclear fuel is uranium with a fissionable isotope U-235 enriched to about 3%. The moderator may be graphite, a pure form of carbon, or it may be water. Because the uranium-235 is so highly diluted with uranium-238, an explosion like that of a nuclear bomb is not possible. Control rods that can be moved in and out of the reactor control the multiplication of neutrons, that is, how many neutrons from each fission event are available to trigger additional fission events. The control rods are made of a material, usually the metal cadmium or the metalloid boron, that readily absorb neutrons. Heated water around the nuclear reactor is kept under high pressure and thus brought to a high temperature without boiling. It transfers heat to a second, low pressure water system, which operates the electric generator in a conventional fashion. What would happen if a nuclear reactor had no rods? Control rods control the number of neutrons that participate in a chain reaction. They, they thereby keep the reactor in a critical state. Without the control rods, the reactor would become subcritical or supercritical. Waste products of fission. A major drawback to fission power is the generation of radioactive waste products of fission. Recall that light atomic nuclei are most stable when composed of equal number of protons and neutrons and that heavy nuclei need more neutrons than protons for stability. So there are more neutrons than protons in uranium. 143 neutrons compared to 92 protons in uranium-235 for example. When uranium fissions into two medium weight elements, the ratio of neutrons to protons in these products nuclei is greater than for medium weight stable nuclei. These fission products are radioactive. Safely disposing of these waste products requires special storage casks and procedures. It is a developing technology. American policy has been to look for ways to deeply bury radioactive wastes, but many nuclear scientists argue that spent nuclear fuel should first be treated in ways to derive value from it and make it less hazardous before what is left over is finally buried. A concept called the Integral Fast Reactor studied in the 1990s but never built, would derive additional energy from what is now waste and reduce the chance of diversion of spent fuel to weapons. Other devices are being researched that convert 
long life isotopes to ones of shorter half life. Rather than deeply burying nuclear waste for many years, the French have been tending and monitoring them in underground storage facilities. Just as the tailings of gold mines and other mines were considered worthless a century ago, but are today being reworked for their commercial value, so it may well be for today's radioactive wastes. If these wastes are kept where they are accessible, it may turn out that they can be modified to be less of a danger to future generations than is thought at present. Notes. Figure 40.8 shows one of many reactor designs for this growing technology. Concept check. How does a nuclear fission reactor generate energy? 40.4 Plutonium. When a neutron is absorbed by a uranium-238 nucleus, no fission results. The nucleus that is created, uranium-239, emits a beta particle instead and becomes an isotope of the transuranic element called neptunium, named after the planet discovered from the application of Newton's laws of gravity. This isotope, neptunium-239, in turn very soon emits a beta particle and becomes an isotope of plutonium, named after Pluto, also discovered via Newton's law. The isotope plutonium-239, like uranium-235, will undergo fission when it captures a neutron. Figure 40.9 demonstrates how neutron absorption in uranium-238 leads to the production of plutonium-239. The half-life of neptunium-239 is only 2.3 days, while the half-life of plutonium is about 24,000 years. Since plutonium is an element distinct from uranium, it can be separated from uranium by ordinary chemical methods. Unlike the difficult process of separating uranium-235 from uranium-238, it is relatively easy to separate plutonium from uranium. The element plutonium is chemically a poison in the same sense as are lead and arsenic. It attacks the nervous system and can cause paralysis. Death can follow if the dose is sufficiently large. Figure 40.9. After U-238 absorbs a neutron, it emits a beta particle and an antineutrino not shown. The atom is no longer uranium, but neptunium. After the neptunium atom emits a beta particle, it becomes plutonium. Fortunately, plutonium does not remain in its elemental form for long because it rapidly combines with oxygen to form three compounds, plutonium-2 oxide, plutonium-4 oxide, and plutonium-3 oxide, all of which are chemically relatively benign. They will not dissolve in water or in biological systems. These plutonium compounds do not attack the nervous system and have been found to be biologically harmless. Plutonium in any form, however, is radioactively toxic. As part of its normal operation, any nuclear power plant converts some of its uranium-238 to plutonium-239. It is more toxic than uranium, although less toxic than radium. Plutonium-239 emits high-energy alpha particles which kill cells rather than simply disrupt them and leading to mutations. Interestingly enough, damaged cells rather than dead cells contribute to cancer, which is why plutonium ranks low as a cancer-producing substance. The greatest danger that plutonium presents to humans is its potential for use in nuclear fission bombs. Its usefulness is in breeder reactors. Concept check. What happens when plutonium-239 captures a neutron? Nuclear power plant technician, physics on the job. Around the world, nuclear power plants use the energy of nuclear fission to produce electricity.
While this process has many advantages, such as reduction of pollution, it also has serious risks. The possibility of an accident in which radioactive materials are released into the environment makes the job of a nuclear power plant technician especially important. Nuclear power plant technicians are employed at every nuclear plant facility. They must have a solid understanding of the process of nuclear fission and chain reaction as well as the properties of radioactive materials. Nuclear power plant technicians monitor the processes at the power plant and are trained to recognize problems and to follow containment procedures immediately in the event of an emergency. 40.5, the breeder reactor. When small amounts of plutonium-239 are mixed with uranium-238 in a reactor, the fissioning of plutonium liberates neutrons that convert the abundant non-fissionable uranium-238 into more of the fissionable plutonium-239. This process, modeled in figure 40.10, not only produces useful energy, it also breeds more fission fuel. A reactor with this fuel is a breeder reactor. A breeder reactor is a nuclear fission reactor that produces more nuclear fuel than it consumes. A breeder reactor converts a non-fissionable uranium isotope into a fissionable plutonium isotope. 40.10. Plutonium-239, like uranium-235, undergoes fission when it captures a neutron. Using a breeder reactor is like filling a gas tank in a car with water, adding some gasoline, then driving the car, and having more gasoline after the trip than at the beginning, at the expense of common water. After the initial high cost of building such a reactor, this is an economical method of producing vast amounts of energy. After a few years of operation, breeder reactor power utilities breed twice as much fuel as they start with. Fission power has several benefits. First, it supplies plentiful electricity. Second, it conserves the many billions of tons of coal, oil, and natural gas that every year are literally turned into heat and smoke, and which in long run may be far more precious as sources of organic molecules than as sources of heat. Third, it eliminates the megatons of sulfur oxides and other poisons that are put into the air each year by the burning of these fuels. Very important, it produces no carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases that can contribute to global warming. The drawbacks include the problems of storing radioactive wastes, the production of plutonium and the danger of nuclear weapons proliferation, low-level release of radioactive materials into the air and groundwater, and the risk of an accidental or terrorist-caused release of large amounts of radioactivity. Reasoned judgment is not made by considering only the benefits or the drawbacks of fission power. You must also compare nuclear fission to alternate power sources. All power sources have a drawback of some kind. Fission power is a subject of much debate. Concept check. What is the function of a breeder reactor? Airport scanners linked to technology. Ion mobility mass spectrometers are used at airports for scanning luggage and passengers. After you check in for a flight, Security personnel will often swab your luggage with a small disk of paper. The paper is then placed in a device that heats it enough to expel vapors. Molecules in the vapor are ionized by exposure to beta radiation. Most of the molecules exposed become positive ions, where, whereas nitrogen-rich molecules characteristic of explosives become negative ions. The negative ions drift against a flow of air toward a positively charged detector. The heavier the negative ion, the longer it will take to reach the detector. In a body scan, a person stands momentarily in an enclosed region where puffs of air impinge on the body. The air is then analyzed by the same technique. 40.6 
mass energy equivalents. The key to understanding why a great deal of energy is released in nuclear reactions has to do with the equivalence of mass and energy. Recall from our study of relativity in chapter 16 that mass and energy are essentially the same. They are two sides of the same coin. Mass is like a super storage battery. It stores energy, vast quantities of energy that can be released if and when the mass decreases. Mass energy, if you stacked up 238 bricks, the mass of the stack would be equal to the sum of the masses of the bricks. Is the mass of uranium-238 nucleus equal to the sum of the masses of 238 nucleons that make it up? Like so much ruled by relativity, the answer isn't obvious. To find the answer, we consider the work that would be required to separate all the nucleons from a nucleus. Recall that work, which transfers energy, is equal to the product of the force times distance. Imagine that you can reach into a uranium-238 nucleus end, pulling with a force even greater than the attractive nuclear force, remove one nucleon. That would require considerable work, as shown in the cartoon in figure 40.11. Then keep repeating the process until you end up with 238 nucleons, stationary and well separated. What happened to all the work done? Figure 40.11, work is required to pull a nucleon from an atomic nucleus. This work goes into mass energy. You started with one stationary nucleus containing 238 particles and ended up with 238 separated stationary particles. The work done shows up as mass energy. The separated nucleons have a total mass greater than the mass of the original nucleus. The extra mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light is exactly equal to your energy input. Delta E equals delta mc squared, binding energy. One way to interpret this mass change is to say that a nucleon inside a nucleus has less mass than its rest mass outside the nucleus. How much less depends on which nucleus. The mass difference is related to the binding energy of the nucleus. For uranium, the mass difference is about 0.7%, or 7 parts in a 1,000. The 0.7% reduced nucleon mass in uranium indicates the binding energy of the nucleus, or how much work it would take to disassemble the atom into individual nucleons. The standard nucleus by which others are compared is carbon-12, which has a mass of exactly 12 units. In these units, a proton outside the nucleus has a mass of 1.00728. A neutron has a mass of 1.00866. An electron has a mass of 0.00055. The masses of the pieces that make up the carbon atom, six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, add up to 12.0989, about 0.8% more than the mass of the carbon-12 atom. That difference indicates the binding energy of the carbon-12 nucleus. We will see shortly that binding energy per nucleon is greatest in the nucleus of iron. Measuring nuclear mass. The masses of ions, of isotopes, of various elements can be accurately measured with a mass spectrometer. A diagram of a mass spectrometer is shown in figure 40.12. This important device uses a magnetic field to deflect ions into circular arcs. The ions entering the device will have the same speed. The greater the inertia mass of the ion, the more it resists deflection, and the greater the radius of its curved path. In this way, the nuclear masses can be compared as the magnetic force sweeps heavier ions into larger arcs and lighter ions into smaller arcs. Figure 4012. In a mass spectrometer, ions of a fixed speed are directed into the semicircular drum 
where they are swept into semicircular paths by a strong magnetic field. Heavier ions are swept into curves of larger radii than lighter ions. A graph of the nuclear masses of the elements from hydrogen through uranium is shown in figure 40.13. The graph slopes upward with increasing atomic number as expected. Elements are more massive as atomic number increases. The slope curves slightly because there are proportionally more neutrons in the more massive atoms. Nuclear mass per nucleon. A more important graph is shown in figure 40.14. This graph results from the plot of nuclear mass per nucleon from hydrogen through uranium. To obtain the nuclear mass per nucleon, simply divide the nuclear mass by the number of nucleons in a particular nucleus. Figure 40.13. A graph that shows how nuclear mass increases with increasing atomic number. The curvature is somewhat exaggerated. Figure 40.14. The graph shows that the mass per nucleon is greatest for the lightest nuclei, the least for iron, and has an intermediate value for the heaviest nuclei. The vertical scale covers only about 1% of the mass of a nucleon. If you divided the mass of your whole class by the number of people in your class, you would get the average mass per person. The graph indicates the different average effective masses of nucleons in atomic nuclei. A proton has the greatest mass when it is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. None of the proton's mass is binding energy. It isn't bound to anything. Progressing beyond hydrogen, the masses of nucleons in heavier nuclei are effectively smaller. The low point of the graph occurs at the element iron. This means that pulling apart an iron nucleus would take more work per nucleon than pulling apart any other nucleus. Iron holds its nucleons more tightly than any other nucleus does. Beyond iron, the average effective mass of nucleons increases. For elements higher than iron and heavier than iron, the binding energy per nucleon is less than it is in iron. Figure 40.15 shows why energy is released when a uranium nucleus is split into nuclei of lower atomic number. If a uranium nucleus splits in two, the masses of the fission fragments lie about halfway between uranium and hydrogen on the horizontal scale of the graph. Note that the mass per nucleon in the fission fragments is less than the mass per nucleon when the same set of nucleons are combined in the uranium nucleus. When this decrease in mass is multiplied by the speed of light squared, it is equal to the energy yielded by each uranium nucleus that undergoes fission. Figure 40.15. The mass of a uranium nucleus is greater than the combined masses of the fission fragments, including any ejected neutrons. During fission, the total mass of the fission fragments, including the ejected neutrons, is less than the mass of the fissioning nucleus. The missing mass is equivalent to the energy released. You can think of the mass per nucleon graph as the energy valley that starts at hydrogen, the highest point, and drops steadily to the lowest point, iron, and then rises gradually to uranium. Iron is at the bottom of the energy valley, which is the place with greatest binding energy per nucleon any nuclear transformation that moves nuclei towards iron releases energy. Heavier nuclei move towards iron by dividing nuclear fission. A drawback is the fission fragments, which are radioactive because of their greater than normal number of neutrons. A more promising source of energy is to be found 
when lighter than iron nuclei move towards iron by combining, as indicated on the left side of the energy valley. Notes, E equals mc squared says that mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. Also, mass is congealed energy. Concept check. How does the total mass of the fission fragments compare to the mass of a fissioning nucleus? If you know the mass of a particular nucleus, how do you calculate the mass per nucleon? You divide the mass of the nucleus by the number of nucleons in it. 40.7, nuclear fusion. Inspection of the graph of figure 40.14 will show that the steepest part of the energy hill is from hydrogen to iron. Energy is released as light nuclei fuse or combine rather than split apart. This process in which the nuclei of light atoms fuse is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the opposite of nuclear fission. Whereas energy is released when heavy nuclei split apart in the fission process, in nuclear fusion energy is released when light nuclei fuse together. After fusion, the total mass of the light nuclei formed in the fusion process is less than the total mass of the nuclei that fused. As the graph in figure 40.17a shows, a proton has more mass by itself than it does inside a helium nucleus. Atomic nuclei are positively charged. For fusion to occur, they normally must collide at high speed in order to overcome electrical repulsion. The required speeds correspond to the extremely high temperature found in the center of the sun and other stars. Fusion brought about by high temperatures is called thermonuclear fusion, that is, the welding together of atomic nuclei by high temperature. In the hot central part of the sun, approximately 657 million tons of hydrogen are converted into 653 million tons of helium each second. The missing 4 million tons of mass is discharged as radiant energy. Figure 40.17. When protons fuse to form helium, mass is reduced and energy is released. A. The mass of a single proton is more than the mass per nucleon in a helium-4 nucleus. B. Two protons and two neutrons have more total mass when they are free than when they are combined in a helium nucleus. Figure 40.16. The difference in the mass of heavy nucleus and its fission fragments is the energy released in the fission process. Such reactions are quite literally nuclear burning. Thermonuclear fusion is analogous to ordinary chemical combustion. Notes. The most important graphs in this book are shown in figures 40.14, 40.15, and 40.17, which reveal the energy of the atomic nucleus, a primary source of energy in the universe. In both chemical and nuclear burning, a high temperature starts the reaction. The release of energy by the reaction maintains a high enough temperature to spread the fire. The net result of the chemical reaction is a combination of atoms into more tightly bound molecules. In nuclear reactions, the net result is more tightly bound nuclei. The difference between chemical and nuclear burning is essentially one of scale. Concept check. How does the total mass of the products of fusion compare to the total of the nuclei that fused? First, it was stated that nuclear energy is released when atoms split apart. Now it is stated that nuclear energy is released when atoms combine. Is this a contradiction? No, no, no. This is contradictory only if the same element is said to release energy by both the processes of fission and fusion. Only the fusion of light elements and the fission of heavy elements result in a decrease in nucleon mass and release of energy. 48.8. Controlling nuclear fusion. Producing thermonuclear fusion 
reactions under controlled conditions requires temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees. Producing and sustaining such high temperatures along with reasonable densities is the goal of much current research. There is a variety of techniques for attaining high temperatures. No matter how the temperature is produced, a problem is that all materials melt and vaporize at the temperatures required for fusion. One solution to this problem is to confine the reaction in a non-material container. The magnetic bottle shown in figure 40.18 is an example of a non-material container. A magnetic field is non-material, can exist at any temperature, and can exert powerful forces on charged particles in motion. Magnetic walls of sufficient strength provide a kind of magnetic straitjacket for hot ionized gases called plasmas. Magnetic compression further heats the plasma to fusion temperatures. At a temperature of about a million degrees, some nuclei are moving fast enough to overcome electrical repulsions and slam together, but the energy output is much smaller than the energy used to heat the plasma. Even at 100 million degrees, more energy must be put into the plasma than will be given off by fusion. At about 350 million degrees, the fusion reaction will produce enough energy to be self-sustaining. Figure 40.18. A magnetic bottle is used for containing plasmas for fusion research. At this ignition temperature, nuclear burning yields a sustained power output without further input of energy. A steady feeding of nuclei is all that is needed to produce continuous power. The state of fusion research. Fusion has already been achieved in several devices, but instabilities in the plasma have thus far prevented a sustained reaction. A big problem is devising a field system that will hold the plasma in a stable and sustained position while an ample number of nuclei fuse. A variety of magnetic confinement devices are the subject of much present-day research. Another promising approach bypasses magnetic confinement altogether with high-energy lasers. As figure 40.19 shows, one technique is to aim an array of laser beams at a common point and drop solid pellets composed of frozen hydrogen isotopes through the synchronous crossfire. According to plan, the resulting heat will be carried off by molten lithium to produce steam. Figure 40.20 shows the pellet chamber at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Other fusion schemes involve the bombardment of fuel pellets, not by laser light, but by beams of electrons, light ions, and heavy ions. As this book goes to press, nations in Europe, China, India, Japan, Korea, and the Russian Federation and the United States have agreed to build an international fusion research center to develop nuclear fusion as a practical energy source. Figure 40.19. In fusion with multiple laser beams, pellets of frozen deuterium are rhythmically dropped into synchronized laser crossfire. Figure 40.20. In the pellet chamber at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, the laser source is NOVA, the most powerful laser in the world, which directs 10 beams into the target region. We are still looking forward to the great break-even day when one of the variety of fusion schemes will sustain a yield of at least as much energy as, re as is required to initiate it, a potential energy source. Fusion power is nearly ideal. Fusion reactors cannot become supercritical and get out of control because fusion requires no critical mass. Furthermore, there is no air pollution because the only product of the thermonuclear combustion is helium, good for children's balloons, except for some radioactivity in the inner chamber of the fusion device because of high energy neutrons. The byproducts of fusion are not radioactive. Disposal of radioactive waste is not a major problem. As figure 40.21 shows, the fuel for nuclear fusion is hydrogen. 
in particular its heavier isotopes deuterium and tritium. Hydrogen is the most plentiful element in the universe. The thermonuclear reaction that occurs most readily at an achievable temperature is the so-called DT reaction in which a deuterium nucleus and a tritium nucleus fuse. Both of these isotopes are found in ordinary water. For example, 30 liters of seawater contain one gram of deuterium, which when fused releases as much energy as 10,000 liters of gasoline or 80 tons of TNT. Figure 40.21. In the fusion reactions of hydrogen isotopes, most of the energy released is carried by the lighter weight neutrons that fly off at high speeds. Natural tritium is much scarcer, but given enough to get started, it can be made in a fission reactor. A controlled thermonuclear reactor will breed it from deuterium in ample quantities. Because of the abundance of fusion fuel, the amount of energy that can be released in a controlled manner is virtually unlimited. Notes. Fusing hydrogen releases less energy per nucleus than fissioning uranium, but since there are more atoms in a gram of hydrogen than in a gram of uranium, gram for gram fusion releases more energy. The development of fusion power has been slow and difficult, already extending over 50 years. It is one of the biggest scientific and engineering challenges that we face. Our hope is that it will be achieved and will be a primary energy source for future generations. Humans may one day travel to the stars in ships fueled by the same energy that makes the stars shine. Concept check. Why are thermonuclear fusion reactions so difficult to carry out? Nuclear fission occurs when the repelling electrical forces within a nucleus overpower the attracting nuclear strong forces. A sustained chain reaction requires that the uranium contain a higher percentage of uranium-235 than occurs naturally. A fission reactor generates energy through a controlled fission reaction. The isotope plutonium-239 like uranium-235 undergoes fission when it captures a neutron. A breeder reactor converts a non-fissionable uranium isotope into a fissionable plutonium isotope. During fission, the total mass of the fission fragments, including the ejected neutrons, is less than the mass of the fissioning nucleus. The missing mass is equivalent to the energy released. After fusion, the mass of the light nuclei formed is less than the total mass of the nuclei that fuse. Producing thermonuclear fusion reactions under controlled conditions requires temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees.